run across this, something like this, as a story like what I'm just going to tell. But a couple of months ago, I was at the drugstore and, and uh, just had a little thing to purchase. And there was one person in front of me in line. And of course, what did they want to do? They want to check about 200 lottery tickets. And uh, occasionally you would hear that, uh, ooh, that it makes you know. You ever heard that one? Hopefully not personally. Don't go play in a lottery because it's a place of false dreams. But that person would do it. They would win $20. That $20 would go right back into more tickets, right? Why? It's because our identity sometimes, not always, but sometimes can be wrapped around this belief that I'm being ripped off in life. That somehow I am not getting my due. And it's something that is entrenched within the sinful nature of humanity. It's something that exists within each one of us that I am lacking what I think I deserve, and that's part of the identity that I have, that somehow, somehow, I should have more money. But it doesn't just have to be about money, does it? I, 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 you know, I never seem to have enough time, and if I, just things would go better in life, I, I would have more time. Or maybe I would, I'm not getting the respect I deserve in life. Or my life should be easier because, boy, I look around me and everybody else's life looks easier. I should have a better marriage. I deserve it. Or I should have better kids, better parents, maybe. Fill in the blank. Whatever it does, when this attitude creeps in that I am ripped off, that I need this, that I deserve that which I do not have, if only this we're different in my life. I want the blanks here. Somehow, in this attitude, I am missing what God has truly done in my life. And really, I am saying God has not done enough for me. That somehow, that life has left me short. If only this were different. I'm going to leave here this morning in a few minutes knowing that each one of us knows that we have been blessed of God. And as a result, hopefully grow in an understanding of looking at a good God and the great work that He is doing is a way to counteract discouragement. Because what we need to do is focus on Jesus and be overwhelmed, overwhelmed by the good things that Jesus is doing. So when I am looking at things in my life that aren't quite going right, when I'm looking at the circumstances, when I'm looking at that person who is maybe not quite all that I hoped would be, when somebody has let me down, that I am so overwhelmed by the love of Jesus that it really isn't my focus. You know, Jesus promised that we're blessed. And Christians, as well as everybody else in the world, often ignore gratitude over a demonic idea of self-absorption. That it's all about me. So I was at this we got through lunch. I did. I was allowed to eat celery. I went to the very last set. It was a long day. It was about 4.30 in the afternoon after we'd sat there since 8 a.m. And done so the day before. And it was starting to get towards the end. And my back is starting to tell me these chairs are getting hard. And I uh, starting to think, hey, uh, i got to probably start heading out here in our last person to talk was, and give a report on the day was the president of our denomination. A guy by the name of David Hearn, and he's kind of one of these real dynamic speakers and all that. And he got up and he said something that struck me as, man, that fits my sermon tomorrow. It was more a line. It wasn't his main idea. But he asked the question of us as Christians, as church leaders, as people involved in the things of God. He asked us, are you a whiner 
or a warrior in the kingdom of God? What a good question. Are you a whiner or a warrior in the kingdom of God? A whiner is the one that says, I am not good enough, or I am stuck with this situation. I am stuck in my life and I'm not happy about it. I'm stuck with this person. I'm stuck with this situation. I am not happy. Are you a whiner or a warrior in the kingdom of God? We hear a lot of things in our lives. We tell ourselves a lot of things. Some of the voices we listen to come from within our own hearts. Some come from the devil, some come from this world that are not good, that tell us that, man, if we could just change this thing, everything would be good. And God comes along and says, you have been blessed. From the very realms of heaven, you have been blessed. The glory of God resides on you. The power of God is in your life and your heart. It is there. And if all you can see is the wrong and say that I need this, that I need something this earth, I need this person to be better, I need fill in the blank. If you are saying that, you are calling God a liar. Because God says you're blessed. He speaks over you and says that. God promises that you are more than a conqueror. You are blessed. He has spoken over you. It is a promise of God that I am blessed with an eternal blessing because of the choice of God. See those commercials on TV for a credit card and they say, so what's in your wallet? All the credit card commercials I'm talking about? I see a few nods and a lot of blank looks. Well, they are there. They ask the question, what's in your wallet with this implication that if you have this credit card, you have the riches of the bank behind you. Do you know what? We have the riches of God behind us. The book of Ephesians, what I read a little bit before and what I'm going to come to now, has often been called God's bank account. God's checkbook or something like that. Because from it, we discover that we have the riches of God. The main theme of this entire letter that Paul writes to this church is that you have the full riches of God, that you have been made into a child of the King, that God is at work in your lives. And because of what God is doing in your life, you have greater value than you understand. You have greater value than what people who speak into your life understand. You have greater value than what the devil is telling you. We're going to look at his opening greeting for a few minutes and see that even as Paul comes to this letter, and even as he's saying just hello to this church in the city of Ephesus, he, Paul is trying to show the people of God how blessed they are. In Ephesians chapter 1 we read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Go to the Gospels. A section in Matthew and in Luke called the Beatitudes. It says, Blessed are you, you are poor in spirit. Blessed are you, Luke just makes it, Blessed are you when you are poor. It's a different word that's used there. That word literally is more happy are you. Happy are you when this happens. Good has come to you when everything in the world is going wrong. Not the word that is used here in Ephesians. In fact, it's not the main word that we find in the New Testament that gets translated blessed. Here it's a very different word. It's completely unrelated to the Greek. It's translated in English the same. It's a good word has been spoken over you. That's literally what it says. That God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, has spoken a good word over top of you. He has spoken well of you. When I was um, late junior high, uh, we would have to go 
to phys ed class, and I remember very vividly that our, our teacher, right at the beginning of the year, we divided the class up into two sections. One was the kids who he was going to end up coaching in basketball and volleyball and some of the other school sports. In gym class, he would take them and they would do drills for an hour or whatever, however long the class was and do it. For those of us, and I was in this group, who were not going to make his basketball team, who were not going to make his volleyball, who weren't going to make the big sports teams, literally it was go outside and play. I don't know exactly how he ever got graded because I'm not sure he ever saw us do anything. But it was, you, you know the idea of pick sides, you know, you get two captains, you pick, you pick, and then somebody gets picked last? Well, he took the kids who weren't even going to get picked last, just go off and do your thing. You're kind of hopeless with sports type thing. That was kind of like how it is. Now, it didn't really affect me, I've got to say, don't, don't feel sorry for me, I don't say it that way. We actually went outside, we had lots of fun. Uh, we actually did do even sports, and we probably did much better because nobody was actually watching us. We had a lot more fun that way. But kind of what is the statement that's being made? In athletics, you're not good enough. That's kind of an important thing in our society, right? Well, for all of us, we have moments of time where we hear that voice that says, lacking. Good enough. Maybe even God doesn't look you good enough. I certainly don't look at myself as worthy. And God comes along and says, Yeah, well, you're not worthy, but guess what? I have made you worthy. I have spoken over you. I have said that this is the way that it is. Not because you have accomplished anything, but because I said this is true. The God of the universe stands over us and says, you are forgiven. The God of the universe says, you have value in the eternal kingdom of God. The God of the universe stands over you and says that you are loved. The God of the universe says you have ability to make a difference in the kingdom of God. And God loves you, and because he does, you have everything that you need. Not that he pretends you're good enough. Not that he makes up something. But he speaks over to us. And he says that this is true. And because the God of the universe said it's true, it's true. The same God who could speak in creation and the universe was formed. The same God who with the word of his mouth can form planets. He speaks over us in the same way. And he says, you are my child. If he says it, it is truth. And that's a whole idea, actually, behind this whole sermon series we've been looking at. These are the promises of God that have to do with who we are. And if God says this is true in your life, it is true. You cannot change God's truth. If God says you're adequate, if God says you, you, know what? you don't have the power to not be loved. You don't have the power to not be worthy. You cannot take away the promise of God. If he has forgiven you, you are forgiven. If he has loved you, you are loved. Because he has spoken over us. His promise is truth. It is not an I hope so. This word blessed is not I wish you well. It is not a wishing. He is coming to people who have accepted the gospel message who believed in the name of Jesus, who have accepted that Jesus Christ died for their sins, has risen again to bring them new life, and because they have believed the eternal truth of the gospel, there is nothing that this person over here that matters against me can do to take away the glory of God in my life. There is nothing that my doubts in my heart that I'm good enough take away the fact 
that the Holy Spirit comes into my life and enables me. I may sometimes question, am I good enough? The answer is no, I'm not. But Jesus is at work anyways, and so I'm worthy of his eternal kingdom. God is at work. In many ways, we could even translate this, that God sings praises over us, which is biblical. We are told in the Old Testament about singing songs about us but engraving our names upon his palms. God is at work. And Paul is giving great praise to God because God is at work. We'd expect at the beginning of this letter, Paul to be saying, I bless those of you who are reading this. It would be kind of a typical greeting, wouldn't it? I wish you well, maybe, even kind of in a, a weak blessing. But he doesn't have to do that. He says, blessed be God, because he has already blessed you. You don't need my blessing. You've got God's. And so we're going to praise God, who is blessing us. We are going to bless the God who blesses us, because as he draws near to us, we draw near to him. We bless him as he blesses us. As he speaks well of us, we speak well of him. Many might want to speak in words of gossip or words that downgrade or compromise. Many may speak of us and we may speak of ourselves that way, but the God of the universe does not. His declaration over us is that we are good. You know, when you go back, the language is actually kind of like the book of Genesis. You go back to the book of Genesis, God looks over creation and says it is good. It is good. He looks over his work of salvation and says, it is good. It is good. Read that second part of that verse. Who has blessed us. Notice that's in the past tense. He's done it. The work is finished. The work of salvation is has brought us into his eternal kingdom and it has changed everything for us. And so we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Blessings, blessings come from the heavenly realms. Literally it says our blessings are from skyward. It's kind of a poetic way of saying from God's eternal kingdom, from out there, from beyond us, from higher than us. And he's using poetic language to say that we have blessings from eternity. And since it's eternal in nature, it cannot be revoked. It cannot be taken back. And sometimes we can feel discouraged. We can feel overwhelmed. We can feel that nothing is going right. And somehow, this is not easy. We need to change our expectations from what this world tells us we need, from what even our heart tells us we need, from what the people around us tell us that we need, and look to the heavens and see what God tells us we need. There's a story of a gentleman who pulled up to a farmyard and he it was a vehicle and he realized there was a kid over there who had clearly just done some archery against the barn. There were some paintings of some targets and right in the middle of three targets along the wall of the barn, <coughs> arrows right smack dab in the middle. I was actually kind of impressed. Not sure that this kid was supposed to be shooting at the barn, but impressed with the archery skills. And he watched as the kid went to the other side of the barn. He kind of followed him around and the kid arrows and this time there were no targets but he shot at the barn three arrows then went God's paint and painted targets around the arrows <laughs> you know with Jesus we hit the 
target every time, but it may not be the target we expect. So maybe we should just change our expectations. To redraw the targets, rather than being consumed by the fact that life doesn't exactly go the way that we think, that somebody doesn't quite measure up the way that we think, that somebody may say something that doesn't go with the things of God, and instead find that in Jesus, we have hope. We need the right expectations for life. Expectations about circumstances, marriage, family, work, church, anything, how any of those is going to play out. If that is where our heart is, we're going to be disappointed every time. Because we're looking to the imperfect to fill our expectations. But when we look to Jesus, to the heavenly realms, to the heavenly places, we're going to find it. You know, it's interesting, this is not the only time we find about heavenly places in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6 says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil. Interesting, same wording here, over the forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now in the heavenly places, there is a battle. A big battle. It's not a good place always. There is a strong battle happening. On the one side, we have cosmic forces that are arrayed against us. And on the other side, we have good. And the definition of good in the Bible is God himself. And God wants you to know that he has spoken good over you. And if there is a battle in the heavenly places and God has spoken good over you, what has the other side tried to tell you? What do you think the other side is trying to say? The forces that are opposed, the forces that are against you, speak words of condemnation, speak words of judgment, Speak words of defeat. But coming out of that struggle is a great ability of a God of all power to bless beyond our understanding despite the battle that is going on. We come out of that struggle because God is stronger. When I hear the words of condemnation, judgment, God comes along and says, no, you're blessed. I have spoken good over you. See, when God is at work, it changes who I am. No one can change what God is doing. Despite my failures, despite the disappointments of life, despite the judgments of other people, despite it all, he speaks praise over us. And that is our great protection from discouragement. It is our protection from the words of the <coughs> devil. It is our protection when our focus is on everything other than Jesus. He is at work. And at times, because there is this war, because there is this struggle, victory at times is going to feel very far away. It will not always feel good. At times we may have a question, where is God in this? But it does not take away the fact that God is near. Jared Wilson Author wrote, if I hear anything long enough, I will start to believe it. This works for the gospel words too. So I stop listening to myself. I stop preaching to myself. 
am not who they say I am. I am who God says I am. He goes on to talk about a quote from Martin Luther, the reformer. He says, yeah, but you're going to hear often in life that you are a mess. Martin Luther says, well, live up to it. Yeah, it's true. And he says, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because my life is in Jesus. I am a mess, but I'm forgiven. I am a mess, but the God of the universe loves me. And what matters is life in Jesus. And Jesus speaks words of blessing. My own doubts, Satan, spouse situation. They can't take that away. Yeah, I may be a mess, but God is bigger. Jesus is in control. To remind us of that, we're going to come to the communion table and celebrate what he has done because this is the price he has paid to bless us. I'm going to invite our others to come.